Hey, Rafael, Dr. Fonseca, great to have you on the call with me. Um, for those of you can see that you've got a nice Arizona backdrop. Um, for Classic those of you Arizona. Know, <laughs> for those of you who don't know, we have great be beachfront property here in Arizona, too. <laughs> so um, I just want to take, you know, just a, a little bit of time to just hear from your thoughts. You've been doing, um, you've been involved in cancer drug development really your whole career. And um, just love to just hear what, you know, there's a lot of dialogue going on right now about the IRA Act as a nine year, um, basically a cliff on uh, price control in the first nine years and then 13 years. And just wanted to kind of just get your your take on how you how you see this helping or hindering drug development as, as, as someone who's been an oncologist for, for a number of years. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity, Steve. And as always, delighted to be talking to you here. Um, so for those of you who, you know, who might not know the Inflation Reduction Act, of course, one of, one of the key aspects of it was, you know, how do we deal with uh, uh, the prices and cost of uh, pharmaceuticals? And of, this has been, you know, a mainstream concern for a long time, and we can yeah. talk more about that. But uh, there's there's multiple aspects of this. I mean, there's some aspects that I actually like that are good. Uh, for instance, the idea that we're going to cap the amount of copays that you know, patients have to pay uh, for their medications. I'm actually in favor of that. Uh, you know, there's no no person that wants to be on a expensive cancer drug with side effects if they don't have to be. There's no moral hazard, right? I think patients who need the medication should be able to get the medications. That's simply the case. And, and it has been a challenge, particularly for those that have uh, government uh, coverage. But but there are some really big concerns with regards to drug development and and uh, the reality is I think we're living through a golden era of uh, drug development. You know, cancer is is quite different from what it was ten and fifteen years ago. I mean, I myself, as as uh, as someone who specializes in multiple myeloma, have seen just a dramatic shift in the opportunities for survival that exists for our patients. I mean, I'm, I'm going to go as far as saying that I. I am uh, solidly convinced that there are some patients that we're curing now, whereas in the past it was just making a disease extend a little bit the life expectancy uh, to one that has, you know, can be in many cases a chronic disease. Uh, when I when I was in training, patients had a two year survival, pretty much, and now we're wow. seeing many patients that can exceed ten and fifteen years. They're not unusual now in my clinical practice. So why are we talking about the IRA? Well, the IRA, uh, you know, has provisions that potentially would result in the um, ability of companies who are interested in the development, particularly small molecules, uh, to remain or become attractive uh, to, to you know, startups and, and biotech companies, right? Uh, and, and that partly has to do with the periods of exclusivity that they would have after, after their launch. Now, you know, someone might say, well, listen, you know, these things are pretty, pretty expensive and there's something we need to do to control this. We can talk more about that in a second. Uh, but the reality is, I mean, this these molecules exist because there's a whole finance that backs their their development, and you know, investors have to look at net present value. And uh, you know, as they see, there's going to be a shorter period of exclusivity. A couple of things follow from that. One is maybe they should be launched at higher prices, but number two is maybe we are not going to be confident in the development process. And uh, so, so this is really what what concerns me. You know, I I always say we're kind of in the in this era, what what I'm going to call perhaps you know one of one of the, the the crest of the development of drugs for cancer, we've seen great progress in infectious diseases, COVID notwithstanding, but we have uh, cardiovascular diseases, and right now we're in the midst of the fight of against cancer, right? But the next big wave will have to be neurodegenerative disorders, Alzheimer's and the like, and guess what gets into the brain? Small molecules. So if if what we're seeing uh, is threatening the cancer drug development now continues, then that's going to be a, a, a major threat also into the future of the development of drugs for, for things like Alzheimer's. So anyway, that's more than a nutshell, maybe more than you wanted to hear, Steve. But um, li like you, I think I'm, I'm, I'm concerned and we need to find ways that there is uh, the right set of incentives for people to participate in drug development. What do you think when people say, well, hey, the orphan... Orphan drugs are excluded. So, Dr. Fonseca, you know, you're focused on multiple myeloma. That'll be an orphan indication. I don't see the problem here. People, you know, investors will still fund an orphan drug development program for just myeloma. Why, you know, that won't be impacted. Yeah, I don't, you know, I, I do, I do worry. I mean, at the end of the day, we're moving in, in an area where in, into an, um, 
uh, you know, a time where essentially everything will be an N of one at the end of the day, right? And some of those classifications remain somewhat artificial um, uh, because let me just start by saying, take a, a quick step out in cancer, every single cancer is different. There's no cancers that are the same, right? So we're moving more and more towards more individualized applications for therapeutics. But if you have an ecosystem that uh, just threatens the ability of some of those molecules to be developed, that is challenging, number one. Number two is a lot of those drugs actually are developed perhaps for, for one indication. They come with, you know, package insert that, that, you know, applies them towards just that very specific indication. Uh, but we've seen over and over again that, yeah, once we have the, the molecule, there's secondary indications, there's different ways by which the drugs are used. Uh, there's clinical trials that support such uses. And who will want to do that? Because, you know, we, we know that you have drugs that are launched, right? And are launched that, um, at, at, you know, in a, in a given way. But we still see a number of trials followed right after that launch for new indications, for instance, from the relapse refractory uh, to the front line. So, so, you know, that allows us then to use that molecule in front line. And if we didn't have that, well, first of all, we won't have the knowledge and we won't have, because we won't have those trials. And then we also won't have the approval. So they won't be used in situations where, where, you know, where this could be, this could be beneficial. Uh, so all in all, I think it just kind of makes the whole ecosystem be, be, be not as attractive for additional investment. Yeah. So, and I get people telling me, say, well, hey, Steve, you've got biologics, you've got small molecules. It just means people will do more work in biologics and there's some great ADC antibodies coming. You know, what's the problem? And I don't I don't think people get that. I mean, these are very different weapons. And to your point, you can't use these weapons in like neurodegenerative disease. Um, I'm doing a breast cancer drug that hits the endoplasmic reticulus inside the cell. You can't get a biologic inside the cancer cells, just like you have a very hard time getting a blood biologic inside the brain. Um, you know, what do you, what do you say to people that say, well, Hey, we just, it's okay. There'll just be more biologics developed for, for multiple myeloma. I mean, there's, there's so much progress with those, with those antibodies. So what, you know, the bio, the small molecules get hurt. What's the big deal? Uh, to that, I would answer, of course, we're excited to have biologics. And if we, if we had twice the amount of biologics that we have right now, you and I would be celebrating because that's great. That's fantastic. But that's not it. I mean, that's not the completion of 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 the mission, right? The mission might have uh, situations where a small molecule might actually be the cure, maybe something that changes, uh, you know, a disease radically. Think about hepatitis C, right? Hepatitis C, which was treated with a biologic, was ultimately cured because of small molecules, and 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 we just wouldn't have that. Now, that's a great example. I hadn't thought about it before, but think about. If we had people that were saying, you know, we have the small molecules that could be affecting a given infection, someone might say, no, we already have biologics that are attending to it. You would not know what you're missing out. So you don't know what you don't know when it comes down to those uh, small molecules. Now, someone might say that from the perspective of, of, you know, perhaps the business to say, yeah, well, you have the biologics and yes, of course that's going to happen. You know, I've, I've already heard it in conversations where people say, hey, is there any way you can tag this molecule to some antibody? You can do an ADC or, you know, can we can we work with a protac or something? But uh, the reality is we're missing out. Instead of focusing on what's the most important, these are alternative pathways, if you may, to get some of these drugs to be developed. I, I let's think about you know you have such a wonderful background having come if I if I may for a minute just your your personal story having come from Mexico you know you you really I think you were you're at Mayo Rochester and basically came down here to Arizona and you know you and a, a team you know built an amazing myeloma program first and then really broadened that you've done some amazing work here um, in the valley and really across the state but going back to sort of your roots in Mexico if you just it's twenty. What year is it? I always forget. It takes about till March to remember what year it is. 2023. And so you, you fast forward maybe to 2033 or 2035, 12 years from now. What does this look like, you know, back in Mexico, for example, the difference between, you know, really going all in and continuing to fund these small molecule programs versus a, almost a hiatus put on it, which is what we're going to see. How, how does this look like from a just a Mexican cancer patient yeah, yeah, you know, absolutely. You would see the delayed um, uh, lack of benefit, right? Because for better or worse, we we have the vibrant uh, environment here that is in charge of drug development, and then those drugs get launched and 
get launched usually first in the United States. And then after a period of exclusivity here, they they uh, ultimately enter that uh, generic market as well, too. And, and But even before that, they're accessible in places um, different than the United States where they already are changing the lives of patients. You know, think about drugs that are used for lung cancer and some of them now transitioning as well to 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 the more affordable sort of generic versions as well too so there's that there's there's that time period that initially happens with drug development that of course requires the recouping of those investments into the drugs but the reality now what i see in myeloma is patients are being able to treat throughout latin america with regimens that are very closely approximate best in class, right? We still have a couple of biologics there, which are fantastic, greatly increase the response. But when you look at the backbone, the small molecules, patients are getting state of the art. In fact, I often use the word, they have leapfrog because we went from a couple of years ago where patients were being treated with very old small molecules. Uh, for instance, a combination of, you know, thalidomide to now state-of-the-art combinations that have uh, things like bortezomib and lenalidomide, which have allowed patients to make that quick jump. So today in 2023, their options are so much better. And it might be that in 2033, the options will be then the same as opposed to what we're currently are doing as cutting edge here in the United States. Thank you. It's such a good, it's so helpful to have that perspective. Um, just one final question. Just you know, thank you for your service in here in Arizona in on you know, on behalf of cancer patients. Um, and uh, you know, just anything you're excited about in the you know just Arizona generally on um, in the cancer field. Oh well, thank you. No, it's a it's a pleasure and it's truly an honor to participate in what's happening here. It's such a beautiful state. Look at your background, but it's more beautiful <laughs> even because of the people and what happens here. This is a state that really wants to be leading change, wants to be on the bleeding edge of what's happening in mm-hmm. in uh, bio and, and, and healthcare. Um, you know, I uh, as you mentioned, I work at Mayo. We just acquired land around our hospital where, you know, we want to bring uh, uh, like-minded individuals. We have investment in downtown Phoenix. And and I think we just have an ethos here that says, you know, uh, we, we, we want to be innovative and today's best is simply not good enough. So I would say stay tuned because, you know, a lot of things will be happening in Arizona and and it's just been a, a, a great pleasure being here. Thank you.